Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're located. My name is Sarit Katan Gribitz. I'm an associate professor of Judaism in the theology department at Fordham University and the acting director of the Center for Jewish Studies this year. I want to welcome you virtually to our community, whether you're a regular at our events or this is your first time, and to thank you for joining us today to hear a talk by Roy Haller in conversation with Katya Givel Nevorach. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to invite you to all of our upcoming spring semester events. You can find information and registration links on our blog and through our weekly newsletter. And I'll shortly put that information in the chat as well. Our next event will take place a week from tomorrow on Thursday, March 4th at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is our first virtual book club featuring Ava Morocek from the University of California at Davis, who will be speaking about her award-winning book, The Literary Imagination in Jewish Antiquity, in conversation with Karina Martin Hogan and Karen Stern. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce this year's second Salo Baron New Voices in Jewish Studies Award Lecture, which we proudly present in partnership with Columbia University's Institute for Jewish and Israel Studies. I want to thank on the Fordham side, Magda Tedder and Siobhan Verleza, and on the Columbia side, Elisheva Karlbach, Rebecca Kobrin, Dana Kressel, and Dina Mann for all that they do to facilitate this program and all of our collaborative efforts in Jewish studies. Each year, we invite a number of young scholars who recently completed their doctorates to share their research with our community as Salo Baron New Voices in Jewish Studies. Through this program, we have been able to recognize outstanding new voices in the field and learn from a new generation of scholars about their subjects of studies, methodologies, and insights. Today's speaker, Roy Haller, is an assistant professor of Israel Studies in the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. He received his BA from the City University of New York and his MA and PhD in Comparative Literature from Indiana University at Bloomington. His current book project, titled Passing and the Politics of Identity in Israeli and American, uh, uh, sorry, in Israeli and African American Literatures, um, a portion of which we'll hear about today, explores the phenomenon of passing in a comparative context. In his work, Roy draws on scholarship on passing in African American studies and applies it to Jewish and Israeli contexts. Roy's talk today is titled Multiple Identity Politics, The Passing Narratives of Dan Ben Amutz, about the Israeli author Ben Amutz's writings and how they relate to his childhood in Poland and the adoption of a new identity in Israel in the mid 20th century and thereafter. I'm really honored that Roy will be joined in conversation today by Katya Gibel Mevorach, professor in anthropology and American studies at Grinnell College. Katya received her BA and MA in African Studies from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and holds a PhD in Cultural Anthropology from Duke University. She is the author of Black, Jewish, and Interracial, It's Not the Color of Your Skin, But the Race of Your Kin, and Other Myths of Identity, and many articles, review essays, and position papers that have appeared in journals and newspapers around the world. Her work addresses the topics of identity, categorization, race, racism, and anti-Semitism, and especially relevant for today's event, her work on identities helped Roy significantly in his research. And so it's a particular honor to have Katya join Roy today to speak about his work. During and after the talk, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Roy will speak for about 35 minutes or so after, Kat after which Katya will offer her reflections and questions. Roy and Katya will be in dialogue with one another and then I'll have a chance to ask them some of your questions as well. If we don't manage to ask all submitted questions, we'll be sure to share them with Roy and Katya after the talk. Roy and Katya, thank you for joining us um, and for sharing your work with us. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm very excited, humbled um, um, by this recognition. And I, I really wanna thank the 
uh, the Center for Jewish Studies at Fordham University and the Institute for um, for Israel and Jewish Studies at Columbia University for giving me this um, this stage today and for inviting uh, Professor Gebel Mevorach. Thank you. Uh, this is such a such a great honor. So let me um, share my screen in preparation for this uh, presentation. Uh, just going to take a minute to upload. Um, thanks. So, so I want to begin this lecture today by first contextualizing my research and then to move on and speak about Don Ben Amotz. And that's not a thing that, you know, many academics did before. Um, in the book that I'm working on, I'm exploring the, the so-called uh, transformations of diasporic Jews into new Hebrews, right, or, or Sabras. And I'm doing so through the lens of passing. Um, why is that? Uh, you know, Zionists, right, they, they really wanted to get the Jews out of the diaspora, right? Um, um, and, and that meant one, physically resettling every Jew in Palestine, and then two, making sure that the diaspora doesn't follow, right? So the, they wanted to get rid of the, this, the, the weak, battered, you know, the feminized diasporic Jewish body, and then instead create this, this strong, confident, you know, proud, masculine, beautiful Sabra, the one you see um, on the right. But, you know, alas, Sabras by definition are Jews who are exclusively burn, uh, born on, native soil, right? That's that's the definition of a Sabra, a native-born Israeli. So what's an immigrant Jew to do? How can one become a Sabra if one wasn't born in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? So my answer is, you know, pass. And I, I borrow the term from African-American studies where, where passing describes the historical and literary move between the races, right? Uh, this, this move often required a complete erasure of black identity and a total conversion into white identity. So in my dissertation, um, which is now turning into a book project, I, I argue that the, the identity shifts associated with the move from the diaspora to Israel follow a similar, you know, similar passing trend. Um, and, you know, yes, we, we have, you, know, you might say that we have other terms to describe changes of identity in immigratory context, right? I mean, assim assimilation is one, for example, but you might recall the Song of Betal, the, the, the revisionist Zionist movement, right? This is from 1932. Um, and it goes from the pit of decay and dust with blood and sweat shall arise a race, proud, generous, and cruel, right? The dam uveyeza you come lanu geza. This is not just talking about assimilation. I, th there was a call for an erasure and restructuring of one's identity in an effort to create you know, a, a new people, a new Hebrew and an improved Jewish race. So I think one of the most um, interesting accounts, uh, definitely one of the most obvious accounts of passing narratives in Israeli culture is the story of Dan Ben Amotz. So if, if the name doesn't mean anything to you, that's okay, you're not alone. Uh, it's, it's been years, you know, for years and years, the Israeli collective passed on the opportunity to resurrect his memory, uh, re religiously remembering to forget. Um, ben Amotz, born in 1923, died in 1988, uh, was an Israeli icon. He was a prolific novelist, a humorist, a journalist, an artist, a linguist, uh, a feuilletonist, and he was also an infamous bon vivant and a polygamist. You know, he wasn't a niche figure. He played a crucial role in creating and uh, uh, shaping Israeli popular culture and, and really in establishing the legitimacy of spoken Hebrew uh, as a, a literary and cultural signifier. Uh, the interesting thing is that, that Ben Amotz wasn't always who he claimed to be. He had a secret identity. Uh, you, you can see him here. Uh, uh, in 1938, uh, Musi Atilim Zogger's parents put their 13-year-old son on a boat from Poland to Palestine. Uh, um, 
his mom sends him um, to experience life in a youth village. It was only temporarily, right? Um, that's, that's what they thought. Um, this is young Musia as he turned into Moshe Shaoni. You know, he, he received a new name once he arrived in Israel, but, but an old name, sort of an old you know, Hebrew biblical name. Um, around that time, Musia, or now Moshe, discovers that his family perished in the Holocaust and he had nowhere to go back to. Rejected, alone, failing to fit in, uh, Musia, the young Jewish Polish immigrant, adopts a new biography. He changed his birthplace from, from Poland, from Rivna to, to Tel Aviv. He Hebraicized his foreign sounding name, Musia, you know, his, his, his old sounding name, Moshe, into, into Dan, Dan Ben Amotz. You know, he didn't just assimilate, he, he passed. Look at his, look at his uh, memoir. This is a quote from, uh, uh, from his memoir. Um, with one quick stroke, he says, I detached the connection with my old self to such a degree that I was now born in the land of Israel. And when I started being born in Tel Aviv and making myself a new past, I also started denying any connections to my correct biography. The new identity I took, he says, in time became my true identity. You know, and he was amazing at this too. I, he oozed with Israeliness, right? Some would say that that Ben Amotz's greatest work was was the creation of his of his own self, right? But he was also obsessed with with passing, with his passing, with with the secret past. I, I, I'll give you some examples. Uh, um, this is one of Ben Amotz's uh, collections. Ma in Hebrew, How to Do What, published in 1962. Uh, on the front cover here at the bottom, uh, there's a note referring to, you know, referring the readers to a photo of the author on the back. In Hebrew, Intunatam Chaber Mecho. So when, when you flip the book uh, to the back cover, this is, uh, right, this is what you get, the silly visual pan, right, a, fo a photo of the author's a photo of the author's back. It's, I mean, it's, it's funnier in Hebrew, but but you, you get the sense, right? He's hiding. He he was so famous and and immediately recognizable anywhere he went. Yet he he presents himself you know, with no name, no face. I mean, even look those of you who could kind of look closely and read the Hebrew um, at the the author's bio right out there. It's it's <laughs> it, it, it says Imber Naftali Hertz, born in Galicia, 1856. Hebrew poet, author of the national anthem Hatikva, um, right? So, so he's even hiding behind the biography of a different person. I'll give you another one. I mean, there's so many. This is um, this is on the dust jacket of uh, of Dan Ben Amotz and Nativa Ben Yehuda, uh, Milon Olamili Ivrit Meduberet, the World Dictionary of Hebrew Slang. So you see again, the author provides his bio, right? His, supposed bio under an unidentified image of a different person. Um, and the bio says something like, you know, Don Ben Amot's born, grew, educated, studied, graduated, yada, yada, yada. Uh, um, and then uh, uh, resigned, was asked on, uh, on the 16th of May, 1938 of a disease. And, and there are so many of these nuggets, almost in each one of his books, it's, 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 it's really interesting, right? But, but then in 1968, Benamotz turns this, you know, this play on identities um, into the center of a semi-autobiographical novel titled uh, To Remember to Forget, Lizkor Velishkoch. Um, the book tells the story of a Holocaust survivor. Um, his name is Uri Lam. Uh, who lost his family in the camps. So like Ben Amotz, you know, the, the narrator of, of the novel, right, is, is a diasporic Jew born a, a, as her Schlempel, right? He had a, a, a different name and he, he changed it. Like, like Ben Amotz, he erases his identity, right? His memory and, and creates himself a fabricated biography of a natural born Israeli, right? Here Schlempel turns into Uri Lam. Um, this is what he says in, um, in the book. When anybody asked where I was born, I'd answer defiantly Tel Aviv. A simple answer that avoided unpleasant issues like Frankfurt? Then where are your parents? What do you mean? You don't know? How did you get here? You have no one here? Really? No one? Oh, poor thing. <laughs> um, 
you know, so, so Alison Hobbs um, in her seminal book about passing in the US, uh, about African-American passing in the US showed that, that in order to successfully pass, one must uh, fool coworkers, deceive neighbors, trick friends, even spouses and children. So, so in this classic tale of passing, right, retelling of passing, Ben Amos's novel presents us a character that, that similarly leaves his past behind, you know, completely erasing his background, uh, uh, his family connections, his birthplace, creating himself a new life and a new um, identity. So on the back cover of the book, we have the opening sentence. Um, let me show you that. In September of 1959, I set out for Germany to settle the claim of my reparations. You know, it's a very provocative statement, uh, completely taboo, right? Claiming reparations was a highly controversial topic and, and to travel to Germany in 1959, I mean, it's, it's unthinkable. Um, but, right, but, but I think more than that, with, with the picture of Ben Amotz at the bottom, right, you see it there, uh, um, the, the book almost presents itself as a memoir, right? Um, and you see, a, a few years before, Yudan Michai published a novel with, with a similar narrative about a German Jew who sets out to Germany to avenge his sister who perished in the Holocaust. And, and this is why I think that, you know, unlike uh, Amichai's novel, ben Amos's book is not just a Holocaust book. It's not a Holocaust novel. It's, it's, a pass, it's also a passing novel, right? I mean, we have here two um, narrators traveling back to Germany post-Holocaust. Um, you know, the, the two Israeli authors, both immigrants, but only one of these guys are act is actually from Germany, right? Amichai, he was born in Germany. He was born in Würzburg in 1924 as uh, Ludwig uh, Pfeuffer. He immigrated to Palestine in 1936, and, and then Benamotz was born a year earlier in Rivna, Poland, as Musia Tilimzager. And um, in this novel, for the first time, he gives away his diasporic identity, right? C kind of getting closer uh, to a confession about his true past, sort of uncovering one identity, but, um, but also, uh, you know, creating another fictional self, right, of, of a German Jew, uh, right, better, better than a Polish one, right, uh, they're more aristocratic. Um, so anyway, the, you know, th there is an opening and closing of a secret. So this idea of, of revealing and concealing is, is, is a big trope in Hebrew um, literary criticism. It, it originates in a 1915 essay by Chaim Nachman Bialik, and, and I think this is what is most fascinating for me, right, in this project, kind of the back and forth movement when constructing and communicating identities, right? The struggle that we see here between the, the diasporic self and the Israeli self is, is really the, you know, the, the meatloaf of, uh, of modern Hebrew literary criticism, right? It, it so often deals with the two polarities of the Jew, the old versus the new, I mean, and, and their fight for dominance. But let's go back to, to that passing confession um, from the novel, right? Um, I, and I want to talk a little bit about those, uh, about this struggle of identities. Um, when nobody asked where I was born, uh, when anybody asked where I was born, I'd answered defiantly Tel Aviv, a simple answer that avoided unpleasant issues, right? Like Frankfurt, uh, you remember that. So, so Nulit Gertz in her, um, essay, Who is a Jew, argues that these storylines are kind of channeling, um, you know, the hero's split identity, right, that this kind of move between Tel Aviv uh, um, and Frankfurt, this inability to, to decide on a certain place of birth, and it channels the hero's split identity. Gertz follows a narrative of friction between um, diasporic and Israeli identities, and she describes the, the, the narrator's own identity as set within a featured space in which he has no real home. Every location in which he finds himself is threatened by other places, she writes, and the identity he carries at any given moment is repeatedly featured by other identities. So Gertz argues that you know, the, the, the plot of the novel sort of progresses to reveal the protagonist's old diasporic identity, the one which he 
had to conceal uh, and repress. So uh, this old identity is hidden behind you know, the, the narrator's uh, fake new self, a self which is um, an imitation of Israeli identity, right? Um, uh, an identity that ultimately exposed as, um, Gertz argues, to be fictional, right? The, the Israeli identity turns out to be fictional, generated by propaganda text of the early Zionist era. So there are two things in this reading I would uh, I would like to comment on, right? One is the, the, that overtime work spent on emphasizing the negotiation of identity uh, and difference between groups, right? This negotiation wants to find the space for multiple identities, um, diasporic, Israeli, but but it kind of ends up creating and reinforcing segregated ones. And then second, I, what does it mean a fictional identity, right? Uh, I, or why would an Israeli identity uh, be, uh, uh, you know, more fictional, uh, more or less real um, than a diasporic identity, right? Why is it hard to believe that this type of identity was was not forced by propaganda text, but but it was desired by an individual? Um, our narrator we see is responding to his environments, right? He, he finds asylum in the answer Tel Aviv, which he describes as a magic word, a word that, that really ends all questions. And, um, and he chooses to use this strategy in his favor. And he's, so I, I think that forcefully diasporing Uri, right? Or claiming that his identity is featured kind of goes against the, the narrative's organic progression. So Bell Hooks, for example, argues that um, identities are constantly changing, she writes. Um, they're changing as we respond to circumstances in our families um, and communities of origin, and as we interact with the larger, interact with the larger world. So, so I think the existence of multiple identities is not a sign of weakness for the protagonist, right? Uh, um, it's, it's, a coping it's a coping mechanism. Whether Uli succeeds in forgetting what happened is a whole different question, but even if we challenge Uli's choice and identity and claim that his forgetting is fabricated, right, his identity remains authentic in its fabrication. Benemotz writes the novel, and he writes in the novel that, that covering the past is, is necessary. Um, he writes, it's, it's necessary in order to live without losing your sanity. Um, Uli goes, scratch out what's engraved in your head, erase what it's written there, forget. If you want to live, the alternative is madness. Now, I, I know we like to talk a lot about, you know, the healing powers of, of testimony, uh, but this has a precedent, right? The, this idea of, of sort of forgetting. I mean, Bialik called this, this madness that, that Benamotz is writing about, um, he called it nothingness. Uh, a void which, what, which must be filled with words. Look at this quote from his, uh, uh, from his article about revealing and concealing, Louis Vikisui. He says, language is, is the barrier uh, man erects to divert himself from the void of metaphysical doubt, the nothingness. Paradoxically, man is constantly and vainly attempting to open the closed reality to level the very barriers of language that he himself constructed as a form of self-protection. So, you know, Nella Larson, Langston Hughes, other Harlem Renaissance authors also worked through similar channels of revealing and concealing of Gilui Vekisui. They erased the past of their characters, right? And in favor for a new life, a new life that they're you know, giving them a, a, a life in, in white society. Um, but, but then they also have them return to that void, right? Return to the void that they left behind uh, through narratives about facing the passing, um, the passing, the losses, the consequences involved. So I think Geltz is right to say that the novel works you know, to show hidden identities, but, but in some way the secret is already out in the open. I mean, right, it's, it's smack on the cover of the book. 
uh, uh, the, the the passing, right? So it, it's not a big it's not the big reveal that's important of the the diasporic identity that's behind the you know the Israeli identity. It's 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 not that. It's it's that narrative tension between the fluctuating identities and open secrets. So so a similar trend happened, for example, in Harlem of the 20th century. I mean, passing. Alison Hobbs, right, was not nearly as hidden as many would have believed. Um, she writes that it wasn't hidden in 1932 when it appeared on the front pages of the New York Times and, and the black paper, uh, the black newspaper Atlanta World, and not in 1949 when it made regular appearances on the silver screen. Um, literature and art were often the most approachable tools to deliver semi-confessional narratives about one's passing escapades. Um, so I think for the time we have left, I would like us to read, um, you know, I would like us to be the readers and, and, and let me see how a close reading of, of the text, of, of, of a scene from Benamont's text you know, through a passing oriented lens can help us talk about Jewish identities in a different, maybe more, more inclusive way. So, so let's recap what we had in the novel. Uh, we have a diasporic Jewish refugee who changes his identity and passes as a Sabra, right? He travels back to Germany to claim his reparations. Um, and then he begins his journey in Italy. He arrives at the terminal and bam, the narrator is accused of smuggling goods and is singled out for an invasive customs inspection. Um, and think about this is the first time um, of you know, for this Holocaust survivor to return to Europe since you know since the Holocaust. So so Benamot's definitely creates this encounter as as a reenactment of Holocaust trauma, right? We have a selection process, and and then the Jew is apprehended by the authorities, um, his possession seized, his privacy is violated, his personal freedom is taken, right? And, and the narrator is angry. I mean, who wouldn't be? Uh, um, he, he naturally connects this event to, um, to the past. Um, you know, he's kind of using the Italian's historical alliance with the Nazis. And, and he says, these fascists, cooperators, lowly bootlickers, they expect you to kiss their ass, beg, implore, degrade yourself just as they did for so many years. Um, so in, in the book, Testimony, um, Crisis of Witnessing, Dolly Laub describes such occurrences as second Holocaust, right? A sort of reawakening of, of the trauma. He says, um, these are historical reoccurrences of an event that in fact does not end. Um, here I have a, a, a slide, right? Second Holocaust. So Nuit Gertz also analyzes this, um, this event, this particular scene, and she adds to the narrator second Holocaust um, a third burden. She, she, she points to the sudden return to diasporic Jewishness and feminized identity. She writes, um, now that he has been identified as a smuggler, his masculinity withers. Women vanish from his fantasies. So this reading uh, relies on the customs inspector's demands of Uri to take off his clothes for a bodily search, right? They want to see if his, his, he's smuggling something under his, under his clothes. So, so Nurit Gertz also sees this act as, um, as it carries a, a homosexual illusions, uh, illusion of sort, right? The, the, the undressing. And, and yeah, indeed, this, the, the intimate scene does include male nudity um, and a re-externalizing of the events of sorts. <laughs> so let's look more closely at the text, try to, you know, try to unwrap this scene. Um, facing a second Holocaust and asked to undress, Uwe has this uncontrollable reaction to his regenerated trauma and to his uh, deconstructed male identity, but, but one that is, is a bit, um, unorthodox, right? With a with a with a burst of uh, this proud and pure and distilled nationalism, Uli, this this modern brave, uh, this modern day brave heart, looks at the customs inspectors and and delivers his innermost truth. He says, "What about the rectum? You forgot to check my rectum." 
so sorry to disappoint you, but it happens to be empty. And as luck would have had it, I let out a splendid fart, rich and mellow with sentiments of national pride and independence. Perfectly empty, I repeated. You know, I have to read this one in Hebrew because it, 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 it just doesn't transfer, right? Uh, you have to read this in, in Ben Amos' sort of live and, and kicking Hebrew. He says, So we have this true act of redemption, right? And, and this great release uh, for the narrator. And he, he says, he comments on that. He says, I laughed until there were tears in my eyes. I laughed while I pulled up my pants. I couldn't stop. What luck to have produced a resounding blast at such a precise moment. And you know, I, I, I figure that you can see, but this is, this is an exceptional scene. Um, literary, literary critic uh, uh, Rania Gil comments on this moment and, and on the signature you know, Benamotian humor. He, he writes, um, in spite of the novel's artistic pretensions, it manages to make the reader laugh in multiple occasions. Uh, humor in Israeli literature is quite rare, he says, and in my defense, I would argue that humor is also quite rare in academic papers. <laughs> um, but, you know, as we see here, I, there, there is something inherently familiar with the chain of events, I agree. I mean, it so easily fits you know, templates of, of diasporic and Israeli identities. I mean, we see the Israeli masculinity kind of being threatened. He is detained, ordered to remove his clothes and you know, prepare for this invasive inspection. And, and this is really sending us back to, uh, to the passivity of the diasporic Jew, right? Um, on the other hand, Uri's bodily response is not quite in line with this theoretical direction. I mean, this is not a response of a powerless victim, right? Uh, um, and yes, there's male nudity, but, but it's hardly a homosexual illusion. Um, and, and, you know, as a side note, I, I, I don't like reading Ben Amotz as a victim. I mean, considering everything that he did, right, he, he, was, he was a victimizer. Um, definitely not a victim. So... No, we, we have an obscene, you know, primal reaction and one that is, is plainly spell, spelled out to the reader. This is, this is a fart full of national pride and independence. So, so it's not the return to old Jewishness, right? Uh, um, it, it, it's not about featured identities. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, the, the, well, what is it about then? Is it, is it symbolizing, you know, the national triumph of, of, the, new, of the new Jewish state? Sorry. I, I, I mean, how much weight can we really, really give you know, to argue that Zionism is the savior of the Jewish people when it kind of you know, originates from a, from a character's overactive digestive system? I mean, would a post-structuralist reading against the grain make sense, make sense at all, right, in, in a scene like this? I think the answer is it's a passing narrative, right? It's a, it's a passing narrative. So Uri is able to, you know, to protect himself through this assumed Sabra identity that he, that he took over. I and mean, he's covering, he's, he's putting up a wall against this void, right? Preventing a potential reawakening of, of the trauma with performative Israeliness. I mean, it's, it's not the perfect way to deal with the complexities of life, right? Sort of uh, hiding and covering and passing. Um, and, and I also know it's, it's kind of a basic reading on this of the scene, right? It's not going too deep. But I think in this case, a deeper analysis also misses, you know, probably will miss the mark. I, I like to think about Sayla Ben Khabib arguing um, um, this quote here that uh, theories of fragmentary and disparse subjectivity, which were so fashionable at the height of postmodernism, ignored demands for stability, control, and understanding. Yet the search for coherence in an increasingly fragmentary material and cultural world is neither wrong nor unjust nor meaningless. Right. So, so following Ben Khabib's theory while searching the text, uh, 
you know, for, for true or false identities, we, we risk forgetting what is right in front of us, right? Uh, um, it's, it's Uli's move to, to dominant group identity, into dominant group identity. And, and it's not forced on him, but it's actually helping him to cope with trauma, right? It's just as passing for African-Americans meant at many points, uh, access to things they couldn't have had without, you know, in, in their own original group. So, so simply put, you know, simply put, Uli generates meaning, stability and control through his affiliation with the state of Israel, with this new Sabra identity. Now, it's not to say I, I don't think that, you know, Benamot supports nationalism. I mean, it's, it's not the answer, right? Just like African-American passing narratives do not see passing into white as the solution for American racism. It's, it's, it's only, it's a tool, right? Uh, it just shows how gray this all is, right? That, that identities are contingent, that they fluctuate. Um, and while Israeli identity solves some of Uli's issues, right? Passing into Israeli identity definitely helps him in, in, in a few ways. I must say that the novel also criticizes performative group identity, right? So, so Uli discovers that a group of fellow travelers, um, you know, these obnoxious Israelis, snitched to customs as a joke. They, they, you know, they, they snitched on him. Um, they say, we played a trick like that in Haifa once, pretending to know someone was smuggling diamonds in his ass. The guy was sure pale when he came out of the customs, but happy, left Danny. He enjoyed every minute of it. So, you know, Uli is ashamed. He, he, he hears this. He, he, he doesn't talk to them, but, but he's really disturbed by, by how the group of people, you know, group of Israelis kind of engage in this toxicity and this toxic Israeliness. Um, he says, I stared at them, unable to believe we had anything in common. Are they incapable of quiet, civilized conversation? Must they tell the world they're from Israel? So, you know, that doesn't mean that we have to immediately say that his identity is broken, right? Um, and to group him back with, with, with a refined uh, diasporic identity. Uh, no, there is, there's no evidence in the text to support such a reading. He is a part of the group, but he's also critical of the group, right? Of the group's behavior, uh, of their toxic masculinity. And, and that doesn't mean he questions his own identity as a result of this discovery. I, I mean, we saw just a minute ago, he himself, you know, engaged in, in, in similar es escapades, right? In, in, in similar uh, um, behavior. So the thing is his, well, his identity can be maintained securely you know, with no reevaluation, even in the face of difference and otherness, it's it's their behavior he criticizes, right? Uh, not his group affiliation, not their group affiliation. Kenji Yoshino, um, whoops, sorry, wrote wrote a tremendous book about about passing. He he called it covering, um, and uh, he's a legal theorist and um, he comments in that book, um, he says, I too worry about our current practice of fracturing into groups, each clamoring for state and social solitude. For this reason, I do not think we can move forward by focusing an old fashioned group based identity politics. We must instead build a new civil rights paradigm on what draws us together rather than what on drives us apart. So similarly, I suggest that instead of differentiating right between the Zionist and, and the Jewish diasporic identities, the novel that we have here kind of produces an alternative approach through the protagonist process of individuation, right? Uh, something that involves uh, kind of a, a um, you know, um, cumulate, um, culmination of, of the two identities, right? Uh, um, um, a culmination of the two polarities of the Jew rather than their um, struggle, right? Something new instead of something old. <laughs> no, it's not like 
that this something new is, is so dandy, right? I mean, we, we, we still end up with winners and losers, with racial power structure, with ethnic inequality, I, I know. The, the novel ends, the, the, the end of the novel, Uri leaves Germany back to Israel intending to, to, to purchase um, this abandoned house in Jerusalem near, near the border, right? And you can imagine abandoned, you know, abandoned why. Um, so, so the reparation money, right? The, the money he received from the Germans, um, compensating partly for uh, um, for Jewish property that was seized by the Nazis will now ironically pay for uh, how, a Palestinian house that was seized by the Jews, right? Um, and this occurs after he, after Uli visits his, his own childhood home in Frankfurt, now occupied by a German family, refugees of East Germany. Um, their house was similarly repossessed by the state. And, and Uri, you know, he gets there and, and he's, he's infuriated when he discovers this, but then his German wife, Barbara, and that's like his German wife as a whole, you know, it's for a whole different talk, um, but she offers the following theory, right? She, uh, she tells him that. Uh, no one would compare the Nazi crimes to policies, policies of the Israeli government, she says. Thanks a lot, I retorted. But still, the Arab refugee, his condition is very similar to yours. You live in an Arab house. The man you bought it from acquired the house legally from the custodian of absentee property, just as your father's house was acquired legally by its present occupants. You can't expect them to be evicted, just as no Arab refugee could demand that you'd be evicted from his house. Now, I know it's not perfect um, solution, right? But, it, but, but it's still an intense analogy to make in 1968, um, you know, to, to, to bring up Nazi crimes and, uh, and uh, um, Jewish occupation in the same sentence. And, and of course, Benamutz lived uh, himself. He lived in an, an abandoned house, um, abandoned Arab house by the port city of Jaffa. And you see it in the background of that, that quote there, right? And, and he engaged publicly in, in, you know, in how problematic this situation was. But yet, you know, this, the, the whole thing doesn't solve um, the critical, you know, critical questions that we have here, right? Re re regarding the challenge of this new constellation, right? Uh, Celia, Celia Ben Khabib asks that, right? Uh, um, you know, the, the strength that Benamot's character finds uh, when he gets this you know, stability by joining the dominant group, right? So, so Ben Khabib asks, can there be coherent accounts of individual and collective identity that do not fall into xenophobia, um, intolerance, paranoia, and aggression towards others? And finally, can we establish justice and solidarity at home without turning in upon ourselves without closing our borders to the needs and cries of others. Um, here, let me let me close this. Um, Sorry, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to finish you know, thinking about this. This quote: Kenji Ushino uh, believes that there must be a way to, to protect difference um, that does not balkanize the country into separate you know, fiefdoms of competing identity groups. He says, he, he says, and I quote, the impulse should press us toward thinking of civil rights less in terms of groups um, um, than in terms of our common humanity, right? Less in terms of groups and more in terms of our common humanity. And, and you know, it might sound unrealistic to hope that through common humanity, um, each refugee in the story would get his own house back, right? But as Yoshino claims, the alternative approach leaves the rights of the people to be determined by, you know, Yoshino, a legal theorist, as a court picking favorites amongst groups. I think that we need to make sure that our discipline doesn't do the same. And, um, and that's my talk. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Your family owned. Thank you, Roy. Wow, <laughs> there's so much that's rich here. And I, I, I did take notes. Thank you. Um, and I thought, I thought I would throw out, it's not, I'm not gonna read the paper. It's not gonna be as coherent as yours. I, and I don't wanna take too much time, but I thought I would throw out several items, topics that we can talk about, that we can expand on, and that um, those who are listening to us can pose the questions and intervene and Sarit can certainly interrupt the two of us having conversation. But um, so there, there, there's so many ways in which to talk about the bravery of this paper. And so I wanna just say one thing about the, why I'm calling it brave. I think because you are opening up a space, a very important space for us to get past a lot of the binary, um, calcified theoretical concepts that have been very, very restrictive on speaking about identities in the plural, of course, and also about Jewishness, about passing, about immigrants, um, turning metaphors that are metaphors in one generation, but very real lived experiences in another generation. So you also open up the possibility for discussions across generations. And so first I want to say on the topic of passing and one of your different, different, one of the ways in which you differentiate between the idea of assimilation and passing. So assimilation, one enters into a group, becomes part of it, but one doesn't necessarily erase the past. We're passing, there are two kinds of passing. There's probably more, but I would say passing as a concept. There are two kinds of passing. One is the kind of passing where people come to a new country and don't want to reveal their past because their past is full of violence. And the other kind of passing is not wanting to reveal the past because I don't want to remember it. It's much more pass pacific in this, with the notion of C. In the context of, in the context of Israel, in the context of post-World War II in particular, those who come to Israel are in fact remaking themselves if they are refugees from Nazi Europe. Some people in Nazi Europe were able to pass, but they didn't pass to be German or to be Polish. I'm thinking now of Heike Grossmann, who was one of the heroines of the ghetto um, uprising in Bialystok. She was Polish, like Dan Benemotz was Polish. And that's very different from German Jews. And, and you know, you open up the possibility for being able to talk about who gets to pass more easily and who is motivated to pass, German Jews or Polish Jews, American Blacks or Caribbean Blacks, or today African immigrants, African Blacks. It's very different. They're not the same kinds of passing. Vanilla Larson passing and becoming white or in the case of her novel, the one person passing reference to uh, one character who we hear about who passed as a black Jew and what that means. Um, in that context, passing can be a matter of survival, the case of Heike Grossman, or it can be a case of shame. So uh, bringing it back to the context of Israel and it's often forgotten, the Sabra and the particular image which you showed that particular image of the Sabra was important to Eastern European Jews in particular. And then it gets very Americanized. That's not necessarily the image that is rampant in Europe, in France, let's say, or Italy or Spain. On the other hand, there's another group of people who are left out of this story altogether. And again, as I say, these are not criticisms, these are different aspects of directions in which we can take Dan Benemotz, the person, and Dan Benemot is representative of a period in Israel right up to 1968, because that, that is not the case today. The Sabra is not part of the lexicon of the younger Israeli generation. The other Sabra, the other firstborn, are those from Mizrahim. Okay, so we use the term Mizrahim today, before it was Sephardi, and before that it was just the name of whatever country of origin. But that picture does not fit the picture either of Iraqi Jewish communists or North African, any of the countries of North Africa, Jews. So that's sort of left out in, excuse me, in our discussions of the Eastern European 
experience that is represented by Dan Benamots, certainly not the experience of an Abba Eben, which is okay, but it does allow us then to say, what do we mean when we speak about passing as an experience, as a performance, and as a metaphor that academics like to play with? And what are the multiple experiences of passing and how is it different from generation to generation? Um, so, so that's one thing. The, the other is the legality. In the United States, passing really meant bypa bypassing, to use the term twice, but circumventing laws and social norms. So the law was very clear about ancestry. The law in America never talks about appearance. It never talks about color which is precisely the point of the literature in the Harlem Renaissance and before about people of African ancestry. And the one drop rule refers to African ancestry in fractions. Uh, that concern about passing is far less important today among Americans of African ancestry than it is sometimes of people who are white and who would like to pass. And so we can ask now, what does that mean? What does it mean for those who were not Jewish, who enter into Israel and want also to become as Israeli as possible? Something which was probably less talked about before the 1980s, I would say, than today where the Israeli society for those who are under the age of, let me say for my children, you know, under the age of 45, that's a society that's much more open, much more receptive to newcomers than the, the period of the 1950s, 60s, and I would say even right up until the 1970s. So that's on passing. Um, what does it mean to be a refugee? What does it mean to be a refugee from a, to be literally a survivor, not in the way that term gets I think sometimes abused today, but where your life is literally in danger, not because of anything that you have done as an individual, but because you belong to a group and that group identity has now been imposed on you, which comes back to the notion of categories of race, race is a taxonomy. And I think um, in some of my writings, some of my talking, I've often said, we need to speak about racism or anti-Semitism because race as a category does not exist except as something, not just as something social, but rather as a classification that's imposed on people. We can speak about racing people. In the context of being Jewish, the existential aspect of being Jewish, which goes beyond Du Bois's idea of double consciousness and of being part of a larger race and race, um, including in the Shir Betal, race, is a euphemism for nation, as opposed to what we come to think of it today. The existential angst of being Jewish is how is about continuity. So it's, we can't forget, because if we forget, somebody's gonna come along and remind us, I think it's kind of timely to talk about survival and what that means in its different iterations, the day before Purim, at least here in the United States, it's the day before Purim. Um, reparations, reparations is in the, in the news today, we're talking about reparations as a reckoning in the United States for Americans, but what repar reparations meant in Israel in 1952 and after that fierce debate, uh, Ben-Gurion capitulates and he signs an agreement, but both Begin on the quote unquote right and Mapam on the quote unquote left, everybody's left at that time, you know, were reparations was something humiliating. Representation, reparations was like, you can buy me out. And again, it's a timely conversation, both here in the U US, but in a very, very different way from the acknowledgement finally of the Israeli government on the Yemenite affair and the children and the government saying, well, we will offer reparations. What is reparation, reparations for what happened by that back? Um, another point I thought to, to, to raise was the meaning of diaspora and what diaspora means 
in the 1960s and 70s versus diaspora in the world of the 21st century. In fact, the world not of 2000, but of 2021, when so many young Israelis, and I speak now as both somebody who's the child of a refugee from Nazi Austria, from Jamaica, an Israeli with an Israeli passport, um, being able to acquire the citizenship of the very country that tried to eliminate you is also a possibility that's open only to some Israelis and some Jews who live outside of Israel. It is not a possibility for those of the Middle East, North Africa, uh, and a few other countries. So that uh, raises questions about how do we speak of intersectionality? Who really can speak about intersectionality in terms of actual lived experiences? So um, the insistence on not feeling guilt, guilt about possessing the house of another who has left as a consequence of war. How has the notion of war become imagined in areas in countries where there has been no war versus in those countries where there has not only been war in the actual physical sense of a government or of a, a, a government versus a liberation movement, if one wants to call it that, however we describe it, and people have been displaced. So the notion of displacement without any possibility to return, that also opens up the conversation of what is it when one is in fact able to return, as in the novel when Ori can go back to Germany, we, uh, we know that um, this is only possible because there's an agreement. So in Dan Benamot's writing, it is impossible, let's say, for Sami, ben, Sami Michael to go back to Iraq. Where does that fit into the story? And finally, because um, there, I have a lot of different things here, but, but this is a way to open it up. Finally, the question of postmodernism. You know, postmodernism never was really a theory. It was a way of looking at things, of unpacking. It borrowed from Foucault. It borrowed from Bourdieu. It borrowed from a lot of French theorists in the United States. But one of the things that was always frustrating for me as an academic about postmodernism, even though it opened up lots of questions, and I'm always asking questions, you know, how do you know what you know and what's the premise of what you know? But the idea of multiplicity took on a sense of fragmentation, of anxiety, of anxiousness. But multiplicity, you know, and I, you know, drew a lot on myself, on Du Bois, on Stuart Hall, multiplicity never really had to mean that. It did not have to be anxiousness, anxiety. Double consciousness is the ability to see from multiple perspectives. Is that generational? Could there today be an equivalent of Dan Benamot's in today's Israel, whether Mizrahi, whether um, Ashkenazi, whether first generation, whether grandchildren, how each generation in Israel, which is so very segmented by age, um, is that a possibility? And I would suggest that no. And, and that contributes actually to your work, which is saying old academic theories, not only are they humorless, but they don't take complications into account as the norm. The norm of the complications, the not norm is to try to force complications into contradictions in a negative sense. Um, so I, maybe I'll stop with that and, and you can take it wherever you want, whatever direction you want. I think, I'm sorry, I think I need to say one thing because somebody's probably gonna raise it. Um, and that's the, the, the question of how we understand Zionism which is beaten up so badly right now. And I do think that it's very important in terms of group identities. Group identities are not necessarily about the leaders, in my opinion. Uh, the idea of having a nationalist movement, everybody has a nationalist movement to which they adhere. So one can advocate for that without advocating also for the dismantling of whatever national state came into existence. I certainly think that, that is possible. And in this particular movement, it, moment, it would be a mistake for us to completely ignore uh, the current government of Israel 
And in that context, there is a, I'm gonna say this as a general statement and also as a question. So it's to, to combine. Do we as Jews, as a collective and as individuals have a particular angst about ethical behavior? <laughs> so, so, so I'll drop those and, <laughs> and, and see where it takes us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have so many, I have so, so much notes uh, going on here. <laughs> Uh, uh, where do we start? Yeah, I, I, I think, well, your statement of your, I think it's a very, it's, it was a very good question whether uh, an equivalent of Don Benamutz can exist today in Israel. And I think you, you, you came with a really good answer. Yeah, and, and I think it's sad. I think, um, I, I don't know, not, Israel sort of, Israeli identity sort of keep, you know, keeps pushing out the other, right? Um, so it's not something that we see in in, in literary theory, right? The, the the sort of negotiation of identity, the differentiation into different identity groups, but we see it in Israel every day. We see it in in, in the political map. Um, uh, obviously, uh, with things like the nation uh, uh, the nation state law, for example, right, which uh, which declared that Jewish identity is the preferred that Israel is the is the land of the Jews, disregarding you know the other multiple identities that are in Israel, and also the sub identities that within uh, I mean, the the Jewish culture. I, I think first we have to work on a definition for what is Jewish in in right in in, in twenty twenty one. Uh, uh, before we start even talking about Jewish identity, right? Uh, uh, Jewish identity is, is also a, a multiple, but, but yeah, you know, think of, you did mention that I work, this talk was only about Don Benamotz and this is sort of an Ashkenazi view of passing in Israel. Um, um, and uh, he himself was, you know, part of a, a dominant cultural elite that was responsible in, setting aside other um, other Jewish ethnicities, right? And authors and, and uh, creators that came to Israel. So again, there's definitely the, the, this, this power play, right? As a pastor, he sort of joined the, uh, the bourgeois uh, right, in Israel and he, he, kept, he kept pushing people aside. Uh, I think probably the most recent cases of, of passing that we have documented in literature in Israel is Syed Kashua. Um, if you think about, you know, his either his columns in Aretz, his books, his shows, uh, Arab labor, um, and sadly he, you know, he left. Again, he, you know, <laughs> we see that there was really hard to have right this dual existence to, to host uh, a few identities in one body and be a part of Israeli society. Or that he has, um, uh, and this is. This is definitely something I'm I'm working on for the book. But Said Kashua has narratives of him, memories of him as a child. Um, I remember the one where he sits on the bus on the way from Jerusalem back home, and you always stop at the airport, right? And then a police officers come, you know, police officer come in to to see that everybody's okay, and he's you know he's passing as a as a Jew, right? He he sits there, and he's afraid, you know, he he's he's mortified that that his passing will fail, very much like what we see in African-American passing, right? Which again, it's not a, for Kashua, it wasn't a matter of life and death, like it was for, you know, Black Americans passing, but it definitely had a lot more stakes involved, right, than, than we see in cases of, uh, uh, of Jewish or European immigrants in passing. Um, so Said Kashua tried and, 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 and he failed as well. Uh, uh, to be a part of Israeli society, right? He now te today teaches um, in, in, in university here in, in the States. Um, so passing is, uh, it, it's definitely something that is intergenerational, that, that it continues, you know, until today. Uh, I pass, I mean, I could say um, my name, when I came to America, my name changed. My name is Roi. Um, phonetically, it didn't work out. And uh, I just, I, you know, I, it's easier to say to people that my name is Roy, but you know, I, I feel that a lot of times a part of my identity is lost to sort of uh, just to, to, to feel more comfortable or get in line with, with the mainstream, right? With the mainstream identity of America. It's easier for me to be, to be Roy um, 
or at least that's what I thought. I'm here for, for a long, long time. And the accent, I mean, I can do Israeli accent, you know, I can do Israeli accent, but you know, I cover it with, with the English accent. Uh, but it also thing that affects uh, my children, for example, if, if we'll, you know, to get together uh, personal. And, and we talked about it a little bit. You know, my daughter, she's American. Um, she's nine. Uh, she was born to Israeli parents, right? She, she goes to a new school here in Florida. Um, it's a public school. It's a more diverse school than, than the school back in Bloomington, Indiana. And, and, and now more African-American kids um, come to school in person, right? The, the more affluent seem to, to do homeschool and, and capsules. But, but most of her classmates are, are kids of color and, and most of her friends are African-American and you know she's she's a Naomi and she came from Indiana so she's white right um anyway she stayed home back in December for for Hanukkah and the teacher I think that her classmates asked uh where is she where is Naomi and the teacher said well it's Hanukkah she celebrates Hanukkah she's she's at home with her family and um and then when she came back to school uh you know, after the teachers mentioned that fact that, that her best friend, Kalia, right, and, and the other kids of her class were like, you didn't tell us you're Jewish. They were, they were, they were really, uh, you know, they, they took it, 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 it kind of clicked somewhere in, in their, you know, conscious identity. The other classmates as well, right? They were, they were really surprised that she's Jewish and she didn't say, and I think, she, you know, they were surprised because she, they perceived her as a, as a white kid, right? And this also top, pertains to your question, what is, you know what is the difference today between being Jewish and and being white? But but you know, like in a in a passing case, they were you know, they're kind of disappointed or 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 surprised or baffled by the fact that she you know she withheld that information right that she passed. Um, so I don't know what it means. I don't think the girls know what it means. I mean, they're nine. Um, but it's definitely a thing, right? Identity is a thing. It's, it's definitely a thing. It, it does mean something to them. I, what, what do you think? I mean, you wrote about that um, uh, in, in your book, right? About your children and, and their experiences. Well, no, I didn't really write about my children, but I did write the theories of, it's not autobiographical at all, right. except for that very beginning. But I, sure. let's, let, let's, let's pick up on that notion of, I don't want to take us too far from Dan Benemotz because I think, as I say, I do think that actually I had to think about it, you know. And I, when you, when you con when I was contacted, yeah. um, I had to think about Dan Benowitz because because I remember when um, when there was the before death party. You know, why should I? Why should the party take place after I'm dead? And I never forgot about that. And I would always mention to people, you know, there was an Israeli who an Israeli celebrity, and then. As a consequence, and I'm coming to your question, but as a consequence of now reading up on Dan Benemotz again and finding the book in English, finding the book in Hebrew is virtually impossible. There were three different Israelis in Israel who searched for it. It's not available. He's disappeared from the bookshelves, um, from, from bookstores. But I also came across a film which is hard to get and I do recommend, and it's actually by a Moroccan Israeli director, an Israeli director who happens to have a Moroccan Jewish background, um, Levi Tzini, and it's called Daba. It's the, I, wrote, I wrote to him, I found his name and I wrote to him and so I did get access to it. But I wanna to come to this point about image where you reference um, looking white, okay? So those four black Americans, putting that aside for a moment, in terms of Israel, the question of how passing functions in an Israeli context, in a Jewish context, is probably very, very important today because the American, the US American, the Midwest, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, they actually think Jews are white and many of the Jews who are fourth, fifth, sixth generation think of themselves as white as well. But in point of fact, within Israel, and this, I don't wanna to go too far in the past for people who don't know enough about Israel, but um, one, of the one of the terrorist attacks on Lud airport, this used to be Ben Gurion airport, was carried out by a German, a German terrorist. And at that point, the Israeli security had to step back and say, we can't assume that somebody who looks European is nice, is a friend. Right. Why is that important in terms of Jewish Israelis? Because Jewish Israelis and Israelis who are Muslim, Christian, Druze, 
Bedouin, Jewish Israelis and quote unquote, not Jewish Israelis, they all look alike. You cannot differentiate. There's no image. What there is, is a media image. It's the way the media portrays, including Jewish publications. That is being disrupted very slowly, but it's somewhat being disrupted by the new Israeli movies, television shows, which are now accessible. So it's unfortunate that Israeli newscasters still tend to, in appearance, look white and bidul um, music and performative look the range of ebony to ivory all mixed up. But I think it's a mistake for us to even allow a continuation of associating Jewishness with whiteness. What we can is because there are plenty of Palestinians here in the United States who look white. And if their last name isn't specifically of an Arabic name, and there are plenty of Jews who have Arabic sounding names, both in Israel, but here in the United States. Uh, most people don't know what um, Azulai means, and you know, or Mivrach for that matter, uh, and, and others. And you yourself are Ashkenazi Bukhari. So hidden behind our bodies, and that was the point of my book, hidden behind our bodies are a whole lot of backgrounds that can no longer be read. In the context of Black Americans, especially the period of passing, not having your body reveal who you were was a matter of being accepted. It could be life. Your life could be threatened. Probably today with the Proud Boys, it still would be. But that's true if you reveal that you're Jewish. So I, I kind of insist on that differentiating between what we look like. And that's one of the problems it's spoken about in Hebrew a lot. But that was one of the problems with the iconic image of the Sabra, the new Sabra, which represented the kibbutznik, yeah. which also represented a disconnect from this oppressive Eastern European ghetto. On the other hand, North African, Middle Eastern Jews didn't really have that. They, they, they were not running away from that oppressive, closed ghetto yeshiva. And ironically, some of that is also back, but in a different way. And I'm thinking of the huge exponential growth of the impact of the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, um, which is not yet felt completely out, at least in the United States. So that's just to differentiate whiteness from Jewishness. Um, even when we use passing as something to explode as you've done, of what does it mean? What is its impact? Is it translatable? Does it transfer? Can we speak about Bosnians and Croatians who have come to the United States in the same community? How do they pass? When do they pass? What is it like in Brooklyn, New York? And, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely know that passing um, exists um, even in, in, in the classical sense. I, I think it, it late, you know, lately we've been um, you're know, navigating this, these, these new waters of you know, the, the ocean of identity politics, but, but we have passers among us, right? Outside, to your question, outside of of the Jewish community, and, and it's completely new and it's fresh, and I know people are still kind of working their feelings about it. But you know, you see pastors, you see modern pastors, anyone from uh, from Rachel Dolzell to to, uh, to the academics, H.E. Uh, Kalilo and Jessica Jessica Krug is, is the most recent one, right? And I mean, I don't know they they have this sad you know this haziness in their eyes. It it, it feels like, and and I know people you know, we're, we're offended to, to hear the stories and to see the stories kind of to, to come out. But we have to, you know, we have to remember that that people were also offended back then um, with with passing escapades, right? Where, where Black communities were angry of, of African-Americans who passed as white and, um, and, and, and the price that the modern pastors pay is, is very similar to the price that uh, uh, African American pastors pay, and um, and I think what's even more mind boggling is is that you know when, when their secrets kind of come out to the open, you see that it wasn't again really a secret that that others knew what was going on, um, 
and we're kind of waiting for everything uh, for everything to explode. So I, I really think it's you know, it's such a fascinating topic that can tell us so much about our identities and not just from a Jewish angle. I mean, and, and, and it's easy to, to, to throw out and throw up such individuals, you know, from from our society. Um, but passing is not just about the passer, right? I, I think we have to remember that um, it's it's about it's about society. It's it's uh, um, um, and uh, and I think it teaches us a lot, not just about identity, but about how we you know how we conceive identity and how group identity uh, uh, conceives personal identity and 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 deals with it. So um, so there's a room to look at passing. I think yeah, right in 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 a greater context, right at, at the community that people pass from. Um, and into the communities that, that people pass into. Um, Can I um, jump in here um, yeah. and ask you a couple of questions that came up um, about passing in sort of larger historical context. So um, someone asked about conversos, for example, and the experiment experiential elements of passing um, in that context. Um, I work in antiquity and there are categories of conversion and then there are categories of God fears, for example, those who join the community, but only partially. And so um, one question is sort of how does, how does modern passing relate to these other modes of passing, um, whether they're things that people chose um, and things that were imposed on people, right? So to pass was to save one's life um, or to stay in a particular mm -hmm. land. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, um, we definitely have uh, you know, books in the discipline that dealt with uh, Jews passing in the diaspora. Uh, um, uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie Wallach wrote a, a wonderful book about Jews passing in uh, Weimar, Germany. Uh, Warren Hoffman wrote about um, Jewish passing in, in theater, I think in American theater. Uh, so I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm the expert to talk about uh, about Jewish, Jewish passing um, in in America, it, it's I focus my research on um, cases of passing in um, in Israel. Katya, do you have? Um, yeah, one could talk a lot about American Jews who have passed. I think I I might no, I don't think I sent you that. But uh, there are a lot of American Jews who came. There are a lot of Jews who came to the United States and who wanted to assimilate. And they yeah. didn't want to assimilate necessarily as Jews who were different. And beginning with, let's say, Gentleman's Agreement, which received an Oscar the same year as Crossfire, they both came at the same time, but Gentleman's Agreement received the Oscar. And Gregory Peck, I, and I, I really recommend it, it is the classic movie that is the transition from being Jewish as an entity because it's not a religion, it's not, we're not Catholics, we're much closer to Muslims um, and turning Jewish into a religion. They go to church, we go to synagogue. Mm. That is so key to understanding or to take a different example, um, how whiteness has taken over. Yes, it's access to privilege, but this is true as well for all immigrants who come to the United States, lose their accent, change their name, move away from their community and blend in. Um, so it's not unusual for Jews, but I'd like to just suggest something else about the passing and the conversos. And part of what we all do is we choose what examples to highlight whatever it is that we're asking. And I think that because we keep coming back and for me, it's easy, you know, yeah, I'm Ashkenazi, my children, they don't look, um, they don't look very brown, except my middle son does. You know? And my granddaughter certainly doesn't. So what? My mother, her sister who was blonde and blue eyed, the grandmother for what I'm named, they lived in Germany, in Austria. And part of the family lived in Germany. They certainly could pass. They were Viennese. It didn't help them. And I think a film like Son of Saul helps us to really understand or helps our students to understand that passing, if it's only used in the sense of what do we look like, 
we lose a lot of understanding of historical context. So again, for the American context, yeah. I'm in Des Moines, Iowa. In Brooklyn, and you're in, you know, you're in New York City, the Jewish communities in the plural, there's no single look. You can't look and say, this person is Jewish. More than that, you can't know who understands Hebrew. So when I came back to do my PhD in 91, I liberally, you know, I, I, we, we were a Hebrew speaking household. Um, we spoke Hebrew everywhere. A few years later, my son um, had graduated, gone to the army, come back and was living in New York City. He was going to Bank Street. We went to a restaurant on the Upper West Side and he says, uh, Ima, you can't, be careful what you say. The Mexican um, staff, understand Hebrew because they'd been working in Israel for several years. There are Ethiopian Jews, there are Yemenite Jews, there are all sorts of North African Jews. Most of all, there are the children who are now in their twenties. We, we and if we don't make the effort to bring in the different examples, then those examples won't be there. As far as the conversos are concerned, this is a question. It's easy to follow the news. And I, I'm, I'm a little bit irritated with the media at the moment because we don't really get full pictures. But not all Jews from Ethiopia, not all the Kessim, accepted those who had converted to Christianity and then said it was out of necessity. Not all the, the Ladino or South American Jewish communities, I don't mean the Ashkenazi South American Jewish communities, I mean the Sephardi South African Jewish communities, are very, um, don't look with questions about opportunism. Right. That's also part of the story. How do we integrate all these stories and say these are not in contradiction? Each piece is a piece of the puzzle as we try in the 21st century to understand how people position themselves and what are the capital P and small p political contexts. Can I, um, the, the hour is getting late and I have, um, I have a, a few questions that um, are being asked about uh, the scene that you focused on in the paper. And so maybe this is a nice way of, um, of sort of wrapping up. Um, and so I'll ask, two questions, very different questions. The first is um, thinking about Jewishness, um, not only as identity, but also as um, a, a textual tradition, religious practice, and wondering about the English translation that you used um, in the story of the farting um, versus the Hebrew. Um, one of the things that I noticed is that um, I don't know who made the translation, but it omitted the line, Todala el, um, thank God. Yes. Um, and then in a line that you only said in English, you use the word blast to refer to the fart. And I was curious if um, in the Hebrew, it might've been an allusion to the shofar, the trumpet, um, the ritual trumpet. And so one of the questions that I had is, um, to what extent, if any, do religious illusions function in the scene, um, but also um, in, in this idea, right, the focus on national dimensions, national pride, mm -hmm. independence, um, but also on the religious identity and what role does Judaism in general play in Ben Amutz's work okay. um, and more broadly in Israeli passing narratives. So that's one question. And then I have a very different question from someone um, in the audience um, and I'll read it. Uh, the character is passing gas at the site of identity control, a carnivalistic overturn in Bakhtin's sense of high and low at the origin of laughter, both passing as a diasporic Jew and arriving at Israeli identity of national pride and independence are mocked and overturned. In addition, gas is a comic reversal of geist, spirit, 
pneuma, soul, etc., all metaphysical emanations of essentialism. Would you agree with his that his literature is an attempt to work through the trauma of any identification which presents itself to be self-assured, self-same, and so on? The passing is the passing of the notion of self-identical itself, which has to be left behind, pun intended. So I wonder if you can reflect, sort of bring us all back to this scene um, <laughs> that, that you highlighted. Okay, yeah, thank you. These are great. These are great questions. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the first question, your question is excellent about the language. You know, so much of so much of Ben Amos's literature is is engraved in the Hebrew in the Hebrew language, and, and so much of it goes away. I mean, I had Bialik in in the talk, right? But I, I do think that in some way, you know, maybe I'm, uh, giving him too much credit, but Ben Amos was a sort of a modern, you know, Bialik. Bialik saw the importance of uh, um, you know, reviving the Hebrew, the Hebrew language is a language that needs to keep like reinventing itself. Benamutz did that throughout his career. I mean, he wrote the, you know, for example, the the the, the Hebrew slang uh, dictionary. But but the, you know, the language is just full of innuendos and subtext. And I think you're perfectly right to identify um, the, the, those worlds. Although it's the same verb for shofar and and far, like you use the same verb. <laughs> When you blow, well, yeah, you blow the shofar and you blow. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, but interestingly, interestingly enough, the novel, which is to remember to forget in Hebrew, the, the title is Liskol Velishkoach. He wanted the, the title to originally be Yishkach um, or uh, Yishkoach, uh, which is the reversal of the Jewish, of course, uh, score that you hear in every. Uh, um, uh, you know the the Jewish prayer on the dead. Uh, um, so 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 he's 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 in the Jewish tradition, yes. But he's um, you know I think he's just using it as a um, well as any Israeli would probably use it today as a, as a cultural standpoint, right? So when he visited the house in in Germany, his brother's the the, the his old house. Um, but now the new Germans, uh, um, uh, the, the German family there, he, he, he notices the Bible um, and, uh, and he, so he said he picks up the Bible and he shoves it in that, that the house owner face and he said, did you, uh, how, how, I forget how it is, the, the English translation, did, did you, um, you know, so, so he does kind of know his way around the Bible, um, but his literature is full of, uh, you know, again, little innuendos, and, and he does work with kind of biblical text, but in, in, a, in a very secular sort of Israeli uh, uh, Sabra way, um, but, that, you know, but, and I think it's, again, one of his sort of, uh, you know, just, just killing all the sacred cows that he can, uh, that he can work through, right, the, the bringing in those, um, uh, uh, those religious observations. Um, the second question, um, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I, I'm looking at it. I, I will try to, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, approach. And I, I know the, the question asker, so I can, <laughs> I can talk about it uh, in, in person. I, maybe I, I want to maybe combine it. If you don't mind, I know we're short on time, but I wanted to sort of maybe answer the second one through, you know, through the first one, because I, somebody, an anonymous attendee wrote, he's tempted to ask out a, about Amnon Dunkner's book. And I think this is something that definitely needs to be out. Um, every time we talk about Dan Ben Amotz um, and, you know, and sort of his invention um, of his persona and his identity control, as, as Dragan kind of asks, uh, the, the biography was released a little bit after Dan Ben Amotz's died, that Dan Ben Amotz's death, and, and it's partly responsible to, you know, the, the eraser of his memory from Hebrew culture. Um, it was, it had some very problematic stories and narratives about Ben Amos's uh, mistreatment of, um, of women, um, 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 you know, sometimes underage women. He had relationships with multiple women at the same time. Um, and the biography kind of brings it out um, um, to the open. It also uh, uh, insinuates that he had uh, incestuous relationship with the mother. So it was, it was a very, you know, it was a tremendous, it was a, it, great, it, it caused great uh, um, response when it came out. 
And, um, and it's something that, that it's important, you know, not, not just to say that Benamot, you know, there's a reason why people do not want to talk about, you know, Benamot and, and his, um, his identity, uh, because he had a questionable, um, a questionable lifestyle. I, I think that studying Benamot, right, um, is still important because as we see with, you know, the passing narratives, uh, I think that studying him can tell us a lot about Israeli culture um, and how Israeli culture came uh, to be, how the identity of the Israeli culture came to be, right? Um, and this is why I would not put him um, on the side because we need to study him. We need to understand what went wrong. If he is the creation of Israeli identity, uh, you know, if, if he's the creation um, of Israeli culture, um, then something really went wrong there, right? Uh, if, if we spoke about Zionism trying to get uh, a masculine, muscular Jew, I mean, here, here we have it, um, and the experiment kind of exploded, right? It became, um, it became a failed uh, uh, experiment. Um, so I don't know if, you know, as, as, as the question asked, if the, if the literature kind of deals with all these things, if, the, if, if he, he works through um, this trauma and his own questionable life through the literature, the only thing I can say, I mean, he does deal with his faults in the literature. Um, and, and um, you know, just this week, we learned about another cultural figure who was actually, you know, was, was really kind of clean cut and pure. Um, while Benamot's dealt with his demons, right? Um, um, Amos Oz um, is, is the one I'm thinking about, right? He was, he was really the epitome of this beautiful Israeli, right? The salt of the earth. And he also had like a, a, a dark and abusive past. Um, so that doesn't mean we need to kind of erase Israeli identity, right? And, and he's not doing it um, in the books and you know, Ben Amos is not pushing for it in the books, but, but, but we do need to see what happened right there. What happened in this culture, sort of bringing these people up, you know, putting them on pedestals. Um, what went wrong um, with, with Sabra culture, right? Um, so I, I think, as is clear, we could easily be here another hour or two, um, but the hour is late, um, and so I want to really extend my gratitude um, to you, Roy, and to you, Katya, for sharing your work with us and your insights and, um, and letting us all into this conversation between the two of you. Um, I, I am really grateful. Um, I want to also um, invite everyone who um, is here to our next um, event, which is next week on Thursday, March 4th at 4 p.m. Um, when we'll be hosting Ava Morochak, who's speaking about her book, The Literary Imagination in Jewish Antiquity with Karina Martin Hogan and Karen Stern. Um, so um, we wish you much luck as you um, write your book um, and we're excited to see um, where all of this work takes you. Um, and thank you, Katya, again, for being in conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Katya, thanks. Thank you, Roy.